It is great to be with everybody. We are in uh, episode two of season two of The Chosen, and we're taking the first half of the second episode. If you're uh, watching with us, you join us for tonight, then uh, we're going to pause and you're going to get to go and watch the first half of the second episode of season two. We're stopping right at the midway mark, uh, about 26 minutes in. If you're watching and you haven't got a counter to look at it, uh, Jesus is actually having a, a conversation by a um, fireside. And when that conversation is over, that's where we're stopping. So go watch that uh, and then come back and we'll watch it. And then we can talk about it together. So here we go. Yes, it goes very quickly. And it's uh, this one is a little more sedate than some of the ones that we've seen. So... It has a, there was, I, when I was watching this, very calm, very calming, lots of dialogue in this one, and the beginning of the, this very important story that the, um, the title of this one is based on, which is I Saw You, and there are little I Saw You moments all through it, if you think back on it, and we'll, we'll do more of this next week when we get closer to the end, but if you look at um the way that the story is, has opened and progressed um, with the big I saw you was the was Philip walking up, right? Philip's, they look out over the field and they see this guy, I saw you, I saw him walking across the field. Jesus comes out of the dark and sees Philip standing or sitting by the fire. Philip sees Jesus walking out of the dark. There's all these I saw you moments that are worked into it. The Matthew sees um, Philip begin reciting the scripture. I saw you. He sees the men reciting the scripture with him. The women see the men. Did you see the look on their face when they started doing the scripture? Um, and even the more intimate moments when Philip is walking with Matthew on the road, Matthew's obviously tortured by some of the, of the implications of his relationship with the rest of the disciples. And uh, when he, when he, bears himself and tells who he is to Philip. Philip's answer is a lot like Jesus, isn't it? And his answer is not um, to the to the way that that um, Matthew is responding in the moment, but it's this deeper recognition, almost like I'm I see you, I saw you. You're the way you feel, the way you're struggling, the way that you are are re reacting and responding to the way that that you're uh, understanding the world. I'm seeing all of this in you. So there's a lot of I saw you moments that come through this, not just the one that's going to come up before the end. So what did you see? What was in this a little little more sedate and a little more heady? I think um, uh, episode. What 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 got you? Oh, you're 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 uh, muted there, Jenny. There we go. You were saying there's a lot of dialogue, and I was struck by um, just a little interpersonal, um, just them talking amongst themselves. Some of the bickering and the um, besting that goes on, very normal human dialogue. Obviously, a lot of it was centered around identity of seeing the stranger approach from afar and trying to find his place in the mix. And then obviously he's more known than Simon Peter thought. And, you know, there was a lot of little mini revelations all centered around identity throughout that episode. So I didn't know the title. Maybe I wasn't listening, but that makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, you, you reminded me, it started even earlier when the, when the disciples were walking with Peter uh, kind of jabbing mm -hmm. the sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. Yeah, they uh, they certainly argue a lot, you know, for biblical people. So that's very refreshing. Yep, yep. And you can see from last week's where really uh, the Sons of Thunder were really on the outs. I mean, there was a there was really getting close to an ugly, ugly um, sort of uh, ambiance for their group. And now it's it's a, it's elevated a little bit. They rec they realize they messed up. Uh, they're getting back together. They're kind of joking about it now. You know, it seems to be better. So they've gotten over that hurdle. And you see what's happened is that the, 
the hurdle that needed to be gotten over was that the lesson had to be not only taught, um, but but accepted by James and John, that they were being prideful, and one could even say hubris, right? <laughs> they kept thinking about themselves in excess, and they needed to be brought low. And, and this, But the second part of anybody who is being too prideful is not that they are identified as being prideful. Pride, as, a, as an accusation of another person, um, when it's not accepted by the other person, is a sign of hubris, right? So if you can't accept the fact that you're being prideful, there's nothing to be done. You just stay that way, and you keep inflicting the world with your pride, not recognizing it, of course, which leads to hubris. And so it's excessive pride that, that defines your life and then inflicts the world around you. So James and John at least have been able to accept the lesson from Jesus and how are beginning the process. And we know who John is, right? This is John, the, the beloved disciple. This is John who eventually, eventually writes the gospel. This is the John who writes the book of Revelation or has received the revelation and writes it down. So of all the people, of all the apostles um, after the ascent, uh, resurrection and ascension, John is like super humble, super humble. Remember, in fact, you remember the last one um, when Jesus was about to read in the synagogue and he asked John, what should I read? Mm -hmm. And John said, after yesterday and what happened two days ago, I am, I, I'm not worthy. You know, and he didn't, he didn't mean it in a fake way. He really meant it. And, and Jesus had that, I don't know if you remember this, but when he did that, Jesus kind of looked at him like, kind of like you. and then he said to him um who is worthy and and uh john says well you <laughs> yeah. you're worthy which by the way comes back in the book of revelation right in chapter five there's uh when they're opening the scroll it says uh, john sees the scroll handed to the lamb and the and the angel says or the um there's nobody worthy there's no one in in in, in any in creation that is worthy to open the scroll. And John weeps because no one's worthy. And then he sees the lamb and the lamb takes the scroll. The lamb is worthy. So it comes full circle. So yeah, who else? What other, what other moment? Philip seems very intelligent, very, he's really into it, maybe more than the others even. Maybe because of his time with John. Yes, I, I think he's really being portrayed as having a, a, a just a more mature spiritual faith. The time that he spent with John, um, even the you know the miraculous events. Remember, he was there as Jesus said, "You were, you were there with John the day I was baptized. You were standing next to Andrew." So he's been witness to some miraculous things, and the teaching of John, while it was you know by all biblical accounts was very raucous um kind of in your face but it also was profoundly correct it was an uncompromisingly correct reliance on and devotion to god so for for uh, philip to stay with john as a confidant and a close follower for that long a time he had to have been um as as focused and devoted as john was so his faith has just had two years to be deepened and resonated. And, and uh, you know, he's been with other people. He's maybe been a leader. He's been an organizer. He's been an evangelist. Most, you know, out talking to the crowd while John is resting, kind of like the disciples do, you know, mingling, mingling with the crowd. So he is the most experienced and has a, a more mature faith. And which shows, doesn't it? Yeah. With him, the way that he's talking to Matthew and the way that he recognized immediately the unkindness in Peter. And how, remember he, even how he introduced himself. He said, ah, you're new at this. <laughs> <laughs> right, out the, right out the door, just named it. Yeah. Has a maturity. 
it's kind of refreshing at this point, isn't it? A little bit that some it is. Yeah. Comes along that has a better grasp of, of what's going on. What else? Any other little moments or big moments? There's a couple of little moments in here that are worth pulling the strings of. When uh, when he stood up, when he made that comment to Matthew, you know, he didn't, he's that was the beginning of his learning about Matthew's specialness. <laughs> right. Uh, and he, I think when he started quoting scripture about the about the wood, about the weapons. Um, he fully he would he would fully expect Matthew to join in with him, um, and it may have been a little confusing to have instead of Matthew join in, to have the guys behind him start chiding Matthew. So he repeats it, then everybody starts saying the scripture, um, and while they're saying the scripture, Matthew's kind of dumbfounded. And the women, Matthew looks pretty much in concert with the women. So what's going on here? What's what's happening that that there is really a division that's being made very obvious, and we get a little peek into it from what's happening uh, in the conversation with Matthew and Philip when Matthew tells him he dropped out of Hebrew school when he was eight years old. So um yeah he he just doesn't know so um hebrew the, the the tradition of teaching in the hebrew faith and this is true for for um orthodox jews today uh, this has not changed this is exactly the same um the, the 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 first school there's three formal schools of teaching and the first one takes place between uh like it, well it starts immediately but really the formal school starts between five and eight years old um and and it goes five to eight eight to thirteen eighteen uh, uh, um, thirteen to fifteen or thirteen to sixteen and basically what happens between eight and sixteen you learn the entire pentateuch by heart you just memorize the entire thing that's what it is it is a massive massive effort to learn and these we're talking about these kids going to school for eight hours a day they are remanded over to a teaching regiment, and that's all they do. And there are witnesses in, in uh, Jewish history of no lunch. I mean, a lot of these people didn't eat lunch anyway, but there was no break. And you, all day long, that's all you did. You recited scripture. You recited scripture. If you, the third school was much less, uh, not as many people, very, in fact, much, much fewer people got through the third school. The third school was for those who were talented, who had an aptitude. And those were the people who, and only those, those were the people, this is the school of, uh, uh, was it Bet, Mish, Bet Mishnah, uh, which is the school that the Mishnah is the reflection. It's the like the commentary of the of the rabbis about the scripture. So prior to this, they've learned the scripture, memorized the scripture, when you get to this older age, you are exposed to the Mishnah, which is the combined wisdom of the rabbis about the scripture. And if you're in this school, this last school, this is the school where this group of people goes out and finds a rabbi. Remember, we talked about this in the first episode, I think. Um, rabbis did not find students. Students found rabbis. So if I went through the third school, and, and read the Mishnah, and I had uh, actually ha obviously have aptitude, I would be then most likely going on to become a rabbi or a Pharisee or a teacher of the law, a lawyer, maybe someone in a temple authority. So I'm going to go and I'm going to find a rabbi. So I would go literally interview rabbis, teachers, and find the one that fit me, the one that I think, oh, this guy right here. So the school of Hillel, is a very famous rabbi, very famous rabbi. Um, uh, um, uh, um, oh God, I can't remember his name. Shoot, any any famous rabbi that would that would take on students, I would go and, and interview this guy. This is why Jesus was so weird, because it's obvious that none of the disciples 
ever made it into the school of Mishnah, the Ben Mishnah. Mishnah. They didn't ever have an aptitude. They were fishermen and carpenters and bricklayers and you know uh, tax collectors. They were not in this. And he, as a rabbi, went and found them. It's completely upside down. It's not the super learned looking for the super learned that matches what they want to hear. This is a rabbi who is going out to the people who did not have this advantage and grabbing them and pulling them in. So um, it's very strange that they would pull Matthew out of this, this class, this opportunity to grow and to become, um, unless he had other issues, which he does, doesn't he? You know, he has really profound social issues. Can't even figure out what a joke is, you know, corn. <laughs> right so he obviously at eight o'clock at eight o'clock at eight years old he he didn't fit in either maybe even more profoundly didn't fit in because at eight you can't hide anything and so his parents just saw that he was a prodigy with his um with the math and and off he went and never never did go back so now matthew's come full circle and he wants to know this stuff well who else doesn't know this stuff Women were allowed to be taught. It's, this isn't like a culture that said women can't read a book, right? Women were allowed to be taught. In fact, they were supposed to know the law. They were supposed to have memorized the law because you had to order your entire life by this. And women were the ones that ordered the household. They ordered, we ordered the, the life of the family. In fact, we can really say this happens a lot today. This is really the basis of, of most cultures and societies. The women run the household. Women create the order of life. So the women were expected and had access to the scripture, had access, but they did not have access to the formal schools of, of learning. The schools, the bet schools, were literally a school where the boys went and they stayed in the school. They met in a group. They had a teacher, and the women did not have that. So their learning really focused on um, the, the scripture that pertained to the way we run our life. It did not focus on the scripture as it would be interpreted to grow as a spiritual being, a spiritual person. The boys may have all that and still not grow as a spiritual person. You can know everything in the world and not grow at all. But if they wanted to, they have that opportunity. Like Philip, you know, when John preached and when John taught and when Jesus preaches and Jesus teaches, all the boys in the crowd, even if they didn't make it through the last school, all the boys in the crowd have memorized the entire first five books of the, of the Pentateuch, right? First five books of the Bible. So they're going to hear Jesus preaching, and before he gets anywhere near being to his point, they're going to immediately associate it with the scriptures that he's referencing and not even saying. Whereas the girls can't do this. They may have some bits and pieces, but they can't do this. So they're looking uh, at at the disciples saying they're hungry you know they weren't maybe they weren't hungry before matthew wasn't hungry before uh, mary wasn't hungry before <laughs> um brima wasn't hungry before and then they had jobs they had lives they had problems they had issues and while they were looking at their own issues and their own problems they were not hungry for the word of god they were not hungry for the scripture now that they've been pulled out of their life and taken by jesus jesus said you're mine now now their hearts are open and their eyes are open and they're realizing, I want that. I want to be able to think in my life through the lens of God's interaction in the world. And I want that. So it's, that's going to be something that comes up later on. So it's a little moment we can miss. I mean, how long was that section? Like that little clip of the women and, and uh, Matthew was like six seconds, <laughs> five seconds. And yet that is so important. The message that in that one little clip is so important. Um, uh, I know we're getting close on time, but another little clip that was actually a big clip, but we could lose it with the, with the fervor of everything else. You know who this is, right? I saw you. So this is Nathaniel. Nathaniel is, had this tragedy happen and the thing. And the implication is, did you get this? The reason the building fell down was not because Nathaniel isn't a good architect. It's because he didn't have the right concrete, the mortar. That's why he was going to the foreman and saying, I need seawater. Seawater is the, is the mortar that's going to hold together this building, and this other mortar is not strong enough. 
And the other guy's saying, no, it's too heavy. We can't carry it. So, uh, and then the building falls down. So it's not Nathaniel's fault. The implication is if it had been done like he said, um, hubris, right? A little bit prideful. It wouldn't have fallen down. As it is, it's gone. And what we learn is that he's actually building this thing for the Romans so that he can build the buildings for God. He's going, he's, he's going through the Roman process to get back to the Jewish process. And when this all falls apart, he goes out in the middle of the field and sits down under a fig tree. So do you remember the story of Nathaniel under the fig tree? You know, I'm not going to go to this. It's in John, John 1, the very first chapter of the, of the book of John. It talks just a little clip about Nathaniel and the fig tree. That's going to come back. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that next week. So I'm not going to spend more time on that now. Just so, just that one part I did want to spend time with you just quickly was that he sits down and he immediately says um, the, the, the cry, the welcome to God, God of the universe, God creator of all things. This is the praise phrase that opens up all prayers. And then, you know, like, oh my gosh, my gosh. Oh. And then he says the Shema, you know, my God, our God is one. This is the decretal prayer for all the, all the Jewish people. Our God, our God is one. And he's offering this moment of, dis, of destruction and death and the, and the death of a dream and the death of possibility and the death of all things that he's planned for his entire life under this fig tree, out in the middle of nowhere, offers this back up. And the first thing he wants to say is, I recognize that you're God. But uh, as wonderful as that was, you know, because he has this teaching, because he's been through the schools and he has these things memorized, which I should say also include portions of the Psalms, not all the Psalms, but portions of the Psalms. He breaks into the Psalm. That was the thing he started saying. We say this in our liturgy at church. You may have recognized it. It's Psalm 102. And in the prayer book, it goes like this. Lord, hear my prayer. This is spoken back and forth. And let my cry come to you. And then continues, hide not your face from me in my day of trouble. Incline your ear to me. When I call, make haste to save me. For my days drift away like smoke and my bones are hot as burning coals. My heart is smitten like grass and withered. You notice the grass all around was all brown. Uh, so that I forget to even to eat my bread. Because of the voice of my groaning. I am but skin and bones. I've become like a vulture in the wilderness, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake and I groan. I'm like a sparrow, lonely on the housetop. My enemies revile me all day. And those who scoff at me have taken an oath against me. Remember the guy said, you're ruined? Mm -hmm. You're ruined. Uh, for I have eaten ashes. I have eaten ashes from bread and mingled drink with, my, with weeping. Because of indignation and wrath you have lifted me up and thrown me away this is the end of it. my days pass like a shadow and i wither like the grass and then we go back to that praise before but you O oh lord endure forever and your name lives from age to age and it goes on it's a much longer uh, 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 psalm but this is the psalm in the scripture that's referred to as the as the um wounded's lament excuse me yes yeah. interrupt i'm going to duck out and pick up william Okay, yeah, we're going to end. Good night, all. All right, love you. Okay. So this is the this is the wounded's lament. This is this cry. So this is him under the fig tree screaming. Right? Do you see me? Do you see me? He wants God to give him a sign to fix it, to make it right, at least to let him know if all this terrible thing has happened to me, I still have value to you. You're going to make this right. And of course, there is no God. He's all alone. And none of it matters. And that's where we're left. So that's where we'll pick up next week. Um, I'm going to play just a little bit of that little, uh, this little short bit of the Philip um, conversation with Jesus as the, at the fireside before we, as we start next week, just about a minute or two to catch us back up and move into the end um really really um uh, fantastic i mentioned that this is a uh, um uh, that same teaching and the same process is going on today and i'll talk a little bit about that and how that's reflective in not a good way uh in our culture in our society in the world all right uh enjoy if you really want to if you're not feeling well you're feeling like you're alone and, and oppressed 
grab uh, uh, your phone or your, your computer or your Bible or your prayer book and uh, go to 102, Psalm 102, and, and read. It's very, it's, it can be very comforting to be able to, to let it out like that with God. All right, you guys, have a wonderful night. Okay. Sharon Thank you. and uh, Jay will certainly, Sharon, will continue to pray for you for, for, for wellness. I highly um, hope that you, you call, maybe you call your doc in the morning and, and uh, see maybe he can help you at least get some rest or something. I'll call him. Here, here. We'll, we'll certainly pray. If you need anything, reach out, okay? Let, let everybody else know so we can give you a hand. Thank you. All right. All right. God bless you all. Have a wonderful all right. night. Bye, y'all. Great week, everybody. Bye, Mom.